mantras of bygone days still ring in our ears. We've come a long way, Professor. We're shattering glass ceilings. We can have it all. We're leaning in and the culture's changing. But is the culture really changing? If it is, why are we and so many of our friends still mad? Mad is in the sense of enraged. Mad is in the sense of maddened, confused, or rebellious. Maybe if you come a long way, you encounter territorial backlash. Maybe if you shatter glass ceilings, you have to walk on broken glass. Maybe if you lean in, you topple over. Thanks for joining this event in the series, American Stories, Inspiration Today, presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, the Boston Public Library, Porter Square Books, and the GBH Forum Network. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at women and literature, America from a female perspective. On your screen is the schedule for our hour long event featuring professors Sandra M. Gilbert and Susan Gubar with their just released book, Still Mad, American Women Writers and the Feminist Imagination. Turning quickly to introductions of our featured writers, Sandra M. Gilbert is a distinguished literary critic, poet, and professor emerita at the University of California, Davis. She is joining us tonight from Berkeley, California. Professor Gilbert most recently published a collection of poems called Judgment Day. With Susan Gubar, she co-authored The Mad Woman in the Attic, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 1980. My co-host, Kristen, will share, share more about tonight's authors. Uh, Kristen, over to you. Thank you, Margaret. Good to be here with you and with David and with our partners at the GBH Forum Network. Hello and welcome. I'm Kristen Motti from the Boston Public Library. I'd like to share just a quick bit of information about Professor Susan Gubar. Susan Gubar is an acclaimed memoirist, literary critic, and professor emerita at Indiana University, and the author most recently of Late Life Love, a memoir. In addition to being the co-author of The Mad Woman in the Attic, as Margaret mentioned, she, along with Professor Sandra Gilbert, co-edited the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women. In 2012, the pair were awarded the Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award by the National Book Critics Circle. Professor Gubar is coming to us tonight from Bloomington, Indiana. We'll welcome them both in a, in a moment. We're so glad that they're here with us. Margaret, back to you. Moving right along, Sandra and Susan, again, it is such an honor to welcome you to our humble series here in Boston and Cambridge. Um, you are superstars in the academic world and among all of us who thoughtfully read literature, particularly women's literature. Um, we can't wait to hear from you. Over to you for some history about your work together and American women writers. Thank you so very much for having us, for inviting us. It feels kind of mystic to. Um...
During the last two decades of the 20th century, the work of Andrew, Andrea Dworkin on your left, Gloria Anzaldúa in the center, and Toni Morrison on the right, elaborated upon identity politics, transnationalism, and intersectionality, as did Adrian Rich. Dworkin in her battle against pornography, Ansel Dua in the concept of mestiza consciousness, Morrison in her prize-winning novel, Beloved, as well as her critical publications on race and gender, and rich in essays and poems about being part Jewish or split at the root. By the 90s, feminist academics like Eve Sedgwick and Judith Butler were responding to the homophobia fueled by the AIDS epidemic to enlist feminists in defending the rights of gay men. In the process, they generated queer theory, as well as much of the language we now use about non-binary, genderqueer, or transgender people. In the same decade, the poet Anne Carson dramatized the painful engendering of erotic romance, while postmodern entertainers think of Madonna and transsexual authors, for instance, Leslie Feinberg and Kate Bornstein, sought to dismantle outworn gender binaries. But by the end of the 90s, feminists, radical, liberal, straight, gay, black, Chicana, post-colonial, post-structuralist, post-modernist, were splintered in an American culture that lumped them all together and demonized them as, in the infamous words of Rush Limbaugh, feminazis. Not pictured here are the women who joined in this backlash against feminism. So it's a real relief to land in the 21st century with Alice and Bechtel and Eve Ensler, who now calls herself V. In her graphic novels, Fun Home and Are You My Mother, Bechtel explores the impact of the second wave on parents born before it and daughters born after it. In multiple performances of her celebrated play, The Vagina Monologues, as in her subsequent global campaign, One Million Rising, Ensler or V sought to raise consciousness about ongoing violence against women. In 2008, Susan Stryker brought out her transgender history and in 2016, Maggie, Nelson, Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts won the National Critics Circle Award. Both reflect the rise of transgender studies and the prominence of trans as well as non-binary advocates. At the same time, feminist writers were aligning themselves with activists against ongoing racial injustice and ongoing environmental threats to the planet. Claudia Rankin's Citizen makes Black Lives Matter, while N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth Trilogy describes the suffering inflicted by cataclysmic climate changes, like what we're seeing now, after the acceleration of global warming. As the Me Too movement evolved, Patricia Lockwood's memoir, Priest Daddy, and Rebecca Solnit's essays protested what Solnit called mansplaining in a society that continued to be ruled by patriarchs, often vicious in their subjugation of women. Beyonce is probably the most famous example <clears throat> of the growing impact of feminism on American popular culture today, especially in her movie Homecoming, which repeatedly quotes Audre Lorde, Toni Morrison, and other pioneers of black feminism. Also a celebrity, Margaret Atwood, whose Handmaid's Tale was reinvented as a TV series at the start of the Trump administration, composed its hopeful sequel, The Testaments, to suggest that sisterhood is still powerful enough to bring about a better world. The feminist imagination continues to rely on dystopian and utopian fantasies. While the second wave was going through a revival, in the 21st century with such political figures as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Stacey Abrams, herself a novelist, by the way, many were, were, they were organizing the disenfranchised to secure their rights under the law. And they were doing this while Nancy Pelosi was the most powerful woman in American politics, second in line of succession to the presidency. Like many of her colleagues, Pelosi wore a white suit when she tore up Trump's State of the Union speech before television cameras to honor the white clad suffragists who fueled her anger and paved the path to rebellion. 
After the shocking defeat of Hillary Clinton in 2016, it was especially wonderful to celebrate the triumph of Vice President Kamala Harris in 2020, the first woman to rise to such prominence, as well as First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, the first First Lady to continue pursuing a professional career out of the White House. Of course, there was backlash against them all, most shockingly on January 6th, when toxic masculinity and proto-fascism raged through Washington, D.C. Did the glass ceilings feminists had shattered issue in the broken windows of the Capitol? Will mad women, angry women, always spawn madmen? We managed to evade such a gloomy conclusion when 22-year-old African-American uh, African -American Amanda Gorman recited a poem on the inaugural stage. We will not be turned around, she declared, or interrupted by intimidation. All the women of the feminist movement who met, marched, struggled, and brought a new order into being helped teach her those words, and now would echo them. So Margaret and Kristen, I gather you have some questions, and we look forward to hearing them. We, uh, we have so many questions. I hope we can squeeze them all in. I, we're going to work very hard at that. Um, that was really a tremendous review of influential American women. I really enjoyed your PowerPoint. And you, uh, most of them writers, but you slipped in so many others, the powerful Beyonce. Um, among the writers there, we have stu studied all of us, so many of their works. Um, we've read and reread them. Um, you make me want to go back and read more for sure. Um, I really enjoyed your book, Still Mad. Um, I, it's highlighted and dog-eared, and I know everybody in the audience is going to do the same. Uh, oh, one of them, it's really you. It's a treasure. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you for making that effort and doing that um, again. And we want you to do it again in 20 years. So we're going <laughs> to stick around for that, please. Um, I'm keeping on, right? <laughs> yes, please, please. You of all people. Um, one of the many things that struck me about it, though, was um, that you really do go back in time and refer back to a lot of other women writers um, in the past. Um, Emily Bronte, born in 1818. Sarah Orne Jewett, born in 1849. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Gertrude Stein, Virginia Woolf, who was so very critical of Victorian England. Um, I know a lot of that is in The Mad Women in the Attic, but can you tell me how these women writers American, connect to the American women writers that you are talking about um, in your presentation and in the book. You really go through time back and forth. Well, as Virginia Woolf put it, women, we think through our foremothers when we are writers. And I think many of these women writers were thinking through these form, through their foremothers. Uh, Anne Carson, for example, was obsessed with Emily Bronte and her brilliant poem, The Glass Essay. And uh, I, I, I personally have a theory that some of James Tiptree's work was, was really a riff on Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Utopian Herland. Um, and I know that Susan has a lot of thoughts yeah, about the science, Alison Bechtel. Well, Alison Bechtel is definitely thinking back through her literary mother, Virginia Woolf. Um, in um, a lot of her graphics, she draws pictures of to the lighthouse and of maps that Woolf herself drew. Um, uh, on the structure of, of To the Lighthouse, Alison Bechtel, who created the Bechtel List, um, which is a, a, a test with a, not really whether a, a movie is feminist, but whether it's friendly to women. It, a movie has to have two women talking to each other about something other than a man. That's the <laughs> Bechtel List. And she gets that idea, yes. I'm sure, from from uh, Virginia Woolf, who basically said that we need more stories about two women working together in a laboratory. Um, so they are thinking back, as Sandra said, through their precursors, through their ancestors, uh, and they find enormous energy in the earlier texts. Uh, so that, for example, one last example, Claudia Rankine is writing Citizen in the 21st century in a dialogue with Zora Neale Hurston, who produced her work in the 20s. Right, and even and even Judy Chicago, who was a who was an artist uh, and and not a writer. Is materializes this in the in the dinner party with all of those plates representing women for all the including criticism the plate, that was leveled at her. Including I mean, a plate on was, Emily Dickinson, right? There was an Emily Dickinson plate. I mean, I personally don't like the design of it, but there was an Emily Dickinson plate and there were a number of, you know, 
important women plays in the in the uh, in the dinner party. There was a Sojourner Truth play. Problematic. Yeah. Did you say who Adrian Rich? Do, who do, who does Adrian Rich think of as her mother? Do you think? I mean, you have a quote here that she was enraged by history, and that's of course you know maybe history with a big H, not you know women's history. But did she look back to anybody, Adrian? Oh, she does. In a lot of her poems, she looks back a lot to Mary Wollstonecraft, and she also looks back to Emily Dickinson. Very much uh, so. And she looks back to Charlotte Bronte. Yeah. She wrote a brilliant essay about Charlotte Bronte. Also, like Virginia Woolf, she was very, very interested in education for women. So she wrote an essay on a women's college just the way a room of one's own is a meditation on what it would mean to have a college for women. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we have David coming on here with a question um, any moment, uh, and he's going to take us even further back into history. Um, David, go ahead. Welcome. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm honored to, to be able to ask a question. Um, the 19th century women writers were much more politically and culturally invisible than their male counterparts. And, and you talk a lot in Mad Women in the Attic is, is that they wrote because writing was literally the only way they had to get their word out. They weren't, uh, they weren't public figures. Uh, the women in this book, uh, by contrast, um, while some of them are politicians. Most of them were not, uh, but they were able to be very active and public and have forum for their ideas and their arguments. Um, so did that, I, I'm curious two things. One, did that make writing less important as a tool for protest? Uh, and two, um, did it, when they did write, did it make them uh, able to use literature as more directly and aggressively uh, to make their, to, to uh, vent their uh, rage and uh, then, then the women in the 19th century who had to be more subtle and indirect in the way that they used writing. I think Absolutely, that's women really, in the 20th, sorry. Very good question because uh, the 19th century, um, the anger we say is basically in the attic, it's concealed inside the attic um, and it has to be decoded in, uh, in order to make it visible because there's so much anxiety about talking about anger. These women who were writing, as you say, were in the private sphere, whereas the 20th century women are in the public sphere. As journalists, as singers, as playwrights, they're outside the home as well as inside the home. Well, well, even as poets, uh, women had women were on stage. I mean, Adrienne Rich did countless readings. Sylvia Plath yeah. read for the, for the BBC. They recorded in the Harvard Library. Um, you know, they, these women were very public, but also I just want to end, suggest that one of the distinctions between the mad woman and still mad is that the mad woman is close readings of texts that were very intricately layered and often full of secrets, while still mad is more like a political analysis and a sweeping historical account of how these women, both in the public and the private sphere, made their voices heard. And yeah. that's how we begin with a politician with Hillary Clinton and we end with a politician, um, Nancy Pelosi. Right. So your point about anger being so much more direct, it doesn't need to be decoded by us. It's, it's right there. So we're interested in how do we trace what the anger was aimed at and how they coped with it and how it shaped the political movement, namely the second wave of the feminism. You could say that anger took the escalator down out of the attic or went down the stairs and out into the parlor and then out into the front yard and then across the street and into the city, <laughs> into the polis. Good questions, great question. Uh, I wanna move forward in time a little bit from there. Um, to you, uh, there's a line in your book that talks about, quote, the extraordinary confusion of the 1950s uh, for young women at that time, uh, the conformity of that decade. I'm so curious about if you could just talk a little bit more about what it did to the literature and to the women um, of that time. You called Sylvia Plath a living oxymoron, which I loved. So tell us well, about the 50s. Plath, Plath is, the, is in a sense an incarnation of the problems of the 50s. She was, she was brought up to be as ambitious as a boy. Um, she had a brother who was, uh, was not valued above her. She was, uh, was encouraged at Smith College to, to follow her star. She was 
ferociously ambitious, but her ferocious ambition also included an ambition to be feminine and to be successful as a girl. And I mean as a girl, as a girl dating, going, being invited to the Yale Junior Prom, for example. Earlier, she made paper dolls of, you know, fantastic figures dressed up like Vogue models. And the, 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 the oxymoronic nature of that, the way in which she was both feminine and feminist without even knowing the word feminism, was in a way, uh, it fuels her greatest poems, like Daddy, for example, The Rage at the Patriarchy. Uh, but it also, in a way, destroyed her because when her marriage fell apart, she had wanted to be a triple threat woman and now she had failed in one of the things that she was brought up to believe she should be successful at, marriage. So, I, I think the that. 50s is the place where we see the contradiction between ambition and artistry on the one hand and the desire for a conventional life, a husband, uh, children, and the, the need to want to have it both, want to have it all, and how difficult that is in the 50s, given the structure of the culture, and how difficult, unfortunately, it still is today for many women. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, the cauldron of the 50s. Uh, in the cauldron of the 50s was brewing the 1970s, uh, yeah. which is just such a, a great um, visual. Uh, so I think we're going to start to move on to some other questions. Um, Kristen, I think you're there. And um, ladies, thank you so much. And I'll be back. And Kristen, over to you for some more, more questioning. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. And now we're going to start to hear from some of our audience members. We got a lot of great questions with the registration form. And Kristen from uh, Oregon asks, are women positioned to transform civilization or have we been so disempowered for so long that we have no control? So I'll toss that over to both of you to, to answer that. And then we'll, we'll hear from some more audience members. I think in a way that question goes to the heart of the feminist project because what feminists want to do is to transform culture so that women are no longer subordinated and, and subjugated by men. Uh, one, of the, one of the central strains in feminist writing is utopian and dystopian writing. Dystopias often reflect the world that we live in or make it seem even worse, like in The Handmaid's Tale. And utopias uh, such as uh, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Her Land or James Tiptree Jr.'s um, Houston, Houston, Do You Hear? are really imagine a world that is successfully empowered by women and powered by women. So um, the, the feminist project is really to do that. It is to transform the world so that women are equally powerful, uh, so that women can, can rule, so that women can rule the world or can co-rule the world with men. You want to comment on that, Susan? Because I, I think that's certainly an important part of the feminist imagination. Um, I think in politics and in the struggle of the second wave, many women don't want to uh, rule the world and they don't want to be saviors and they don't, but they do want equality. And well, they, that's all I'm saying. They, they want to co-rule the world. Yeah. <laughs> and they, and they, and they want, I, I think when, when I, when I hear, you know, I, I, I just think that many, some women, of course, have always believed that there are goddesses or that there are saviors. Or Nobody has used the word savior here. Yeah. But I think in the imagination of, certainly in the literary imagination, we see the importance of imagining a best place, a utopia, and a worst place. Right. And the worst place has everything to do in the feminist imagination with male domination, with tyranny with subordination and with violence against women. I totally agree with that. Thank you for that. We have welcomed some of our audience members here to join us around on the virtual stage. And I'd like to invite Camille to pose her first question. Um, so Camille, over to you and thank you for your question. Thank you, and thanks for this presentation. I like your idea of not dominating, but when do you see full equality? Uh, Justice Ginsburg said it would be when there were nine women on the Supreme Court. Right. So how do you see that? And thank you again for your 
presentation and for inviting us. Okay. I was just going to say that. I was just going to quote Ginsburg on nine, nine women on the Supreme Court. But I would also say when Kamala Harris would not be vice president, but president. I mean, ours is one of the one of the only industrial uh, countries or one of one of the, uh, you know, one of the only countries that has not ever had a woman leader. Many, many other countries have women presidents, just the way other countries have healthcare systems. Right. So it would be very nice if our country could have uh, a woman at the at the top of the, of the pyramid, not to rule and dominate, but to join in the ruling of the world. At the moment, there are, you know, like how many women in the Senate? And, and, and Susan, remember the, the problem about bathrooms for women in not the Senate? Not enough bathrooms. Not they, enough they didn't have enough bathrooms when women started going to the Senate. There was like no women's bathroom in the Senate. And, and that was not really only very, in the- Not until was, very late in the 20th century was there, were there women's bathrooms. I, the, sad, the sad underlying story here is that when we look back on the long haul of history, we don't have many examples of truly equal societies. Uh, there are myths about matriarchies and there are uh, legends about equal societies, but there are very few historical actual evidences of fully, equal, full equality, gender equality in the history of humankind. So in that sense, I think that underlines Sandra's point before, this is a utopian hope. That is, it's, it's a hope, it's a hope to establish something that hasn't really had a historical precedent. Oh, but what is unprecedented is the, is the transformation of society from the, from the, uh, from the 19th century to the beginning of the 21st century. We would not be on this. We would not be in these, in this Zoom in this Zoom box, um, we would not be wearing wearing pants suits. We would not be doing most of the things that we do if we were living two hundred years ago. Oh, of I mean, course. Is, and there has never no, been there has never been course. an historical moment when women could speak in public as we can speak in public. So what, you're Roger, saying is, what you're saying is that you see signs of progress, right? But right. we don't see. We don't see models in the past of the full equality that we aim for. No, we don't see models in the past, except in the in the in the products of the of the female imagination of the past. Right, right, right. Where women from from Charlotte uh, from Christine de Pizan through Charlotte Perkins Gilman were imagining utopias in which women were able to express themselves and to be powerful. Yeah. Uh, Christine de Pizan in the 14th century wrote *The City of Ladies*. In which the, it was a women's educational institution, but also a kind of republic of women. And Charlotte Perkins Gilman, of course, produced her land in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and now, in a way, with all of those women in, in Congress wearing white pantsuits, as Nancy Pelosi tore up the State of the Union speech, we were beginning to see in reality something like what people had only dreamt of in the 19th century. It was, it really happened. We really saw it. So. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you, Camille, for your question and for Camille. sharing with us. Kelly, you're next. What's your thank question? You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your beautiful book and for this wonderful conversation. I'm really delighted to be part of it. Um, I have, like many people I expect, have been thinking and reading a lot about grieving and grief and how we express grief. Um, in Joan Didion's two books about the loss of her husband and her daughter, she expresses her, the grief at her loss, but also her longing and yearning and wishing to bring them back to life, which she does in a way by writing about them. Have you seen the themes of grief and yearning as part of the feminist writing tradition or common to the lived experience of the writers you've studied? I'd like to respond to that um, by saying that I have studied elegy, women, elegies written by women and by men. And I noticed that there is a really distinctive difference um, until actually things change a little bit in the 20th century. But in, in women's poetry about, about loss, as in Didion's books and as in countless memoirs by, by women who are grieving losses, uh, Women are, are much more personal, ta 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 tactile almost. 
I mean, like the shoes, right? The, the pair of shoes with which that book starts and, and the shoes go back actually to Jacob's room by Virginia Woolf, where Jacob dies, her, her protagonist dies, dies in, the, in the First World War and his mother picks up a pair of shoes and says, what will I do with them? And in the year of magical thinking, Didion picks up her husband's shoes and says, well, I, I need to keep them because he might come back and need them. Now, men don't write that way about grief until maybe during the 20th century, they are influenced by women's writing. I mean, this, this influence, the dynamics go two ways in, in grief writing. Um, but, but it is really true that going back almost to classical Greek culture, women went into the woods and howled like the Bacchae, for example, but men spoke on the public stage with extremely controlled rhetoric. So the classic pastoral elegy, for example, was by a male poet uh, mourning for the loss of, of, a, of another man. Uh, and women didn't write that kind of stuff. They, they wrote about the loss of babies, the loss of husbands, and they wrote personally and, uh, and very, as I say, very almost tactilely. Um, but then in the 20th century, men start writing more like women. And so they've been influenced by, by a kind of female tradition here. I would like to add that where I see grief in, in the feminist tradition is in uh, Kate Millett and, uh, and Andrea Dworkin, and to a certain extent, Gloria Anzal Dua, all of whom are writing about the difficulties of women who are suffering domestic battery, abuse, domestic violence, um, Millette mourns uh, met women who have been killed by their husbands um, and, and has written some really grief drenched books on, um, on what male dominance means on a personal individual level. I also think we should mention that Didion plays a rather equivocal role in Still Mad um, because uh, one of the themes we trace in Still Mad is the, um, the voices of women who are uh, anti-feminist. And Didion, to some extent, falls into that rubric in the 70s. She seems to associate feminism with the victimization of women, rather than as a protest against the victimization of women. So we have, we have a sort of, she, she plays an equivocal role. Thank you for that. Sharon, your question. Okay. Um... Thanks so much for having me. And hello, Susan and Sandra. I've heard Sandra read her poetry in the Bay Area when I used to live there. So um, my question, I was fascinated by Jean Reese's novel, Why the Sargasso Sea, which gave such a sympathetic view of Bertha, a mad woman in the attic of Charlotte Bronte's novel, Jane Eyre. And I wondered what, what do you think she and Charlotte might say to each other about the character if they could meet? Andrew? I said, I think Charlotte would be scandalized. I, I don't, think so. I, I think she I think would be completely so. scandalized by the idea of giving Bertha a voice. Um, she just, she can't imagine Bertha as real. I mean, Bertha is so uh, physically other, so racially other, so madly Anim other, and yet Anim at the same, and animalistic, and yet at the same time, she's everything that, that uh, Jane and Charlotte herself have been taught to repress. And, but we know that they, she hasn't been repressed because she is there she is in the attic raging away and ultimately burning the house down and leveling the playing field for Rochester and Jane. So um, I, I think that she would be scandalized by, by Jean Reese. I, I agree. It's very brilliant of Jean Reese, however, to go back into the past and give Bertha a voice because Jean Reese herself knew, knew the Caribbean and so she was. She could write about that, and she could really, she could really go to the bottom of it. She could go to the origin, the, the originary place where Bertha came from, and give it a kind of reality that that I think is quite wonderful. I, yeah, I I, I think she would have been scandalized. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Peter, over to you for your question. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you, Sandra and Susan. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, really appreciate your, all your work and really excited about what you'll be doing even further beyond, beyond today. Um, you've already touched on one of my favorite authors. It's more of a sort of a current or contemporary writer, which is Alison Bechtel, um, who fascinates me, not just by the story she tells, but that she's a graphic novelist. So she's working in a slightly different medium. 
Um, so that's that's where I'd like to direct my question. It's sort of the, the current environment and how you see that in the broader context of what you're talking about. Another example might be, um, uh, there's a terrific actually comic book written by an American woman, uh, Kelly Sue uh, DeConnick called Bitch Planet, um, which is very femme centric and very exciting. And I'm also thinking of Carmen Maria Machado who wrote In the Dream House, which is a, it's a tough subject. It's about an abusive relationship, but it's done in a very imaginative, uh, imaginative way that sort of breaks through the, the traditional style. So my question to you is, uh, to you both is, how do you see the, the present day transgender or gender rights authors uh, situated within the, the longer feminist literary tradition? I think that the transgender conversation starts in the 80s and the 90s, oddly enough, with lesbian separatists who are objecting to trans women as men who are going to the women's festivals that are supposed to be only for women and transgressing and trying to you know, hone in on women's territory. Uh, and and that, that unfortunate response to trans women got a big response in the 90s when trans people started speaking up for themselves. So uh, you see people like, um, well, Sandy Stone uh, writing a, a manifesto uh, for trans women. Um, that's in the 90s and Leslie Feinberg writing a novel about a he, she character. And I see that trans writers are increasingly carving out a place for themselves. Um, the auth and, and they're doing so, you mentioned genres that are innovative, like the graphic novel. They're doing so in innovative genres that like the graphic novel are trying to cross a divide between being sophisticated theoretically about thinking about trans identity and culture, at the same time reaching out to a popular broad audience that will enjoy the book or the work. So for example, the recent TV show Pose was written by a woman who is a trans woman and who's written several memoirs about being trans. And, um, and she's very interested in thinking theoretically about trans identity, but she also wants to reach a broad audience. And I think, I think TV starting with Transparent going to Pose has played a very interesting role in that. I'd like to say something too about the use of the graphic novel or the comic book genre, which is what I thought you were addressing when you asked about Bechtel. I mean, that is that is really interesting for women to be doing that. That was comics, as you know, were such a macho genre. I mean, Captain from Captain Marvel onward and Superman and Batman, that comic book genre is so, and, and even, even, you know, sort of more high level ones like Asterix or Tintin in France, which were more like our graphic novels, you know, more slightly less comic booky in our sense. So it's really wonderful to see that these women began invading that genre and that Bechtel made such a, a great use of, of the genre and just taking it over for, for a feminist and a lesbian uh, to discuss her, her life in the world. Um, I don't know whether anybody knows, but Patricia Highsmith, who I do not think of as a feminist, once worked as a comic book writer. She wrote the, uh, she, didn't, she didn't do the, um, the pictures, but she wrote the, the dialogue. And you, it sounds like you know that, Peter. And I think that it influenced her. I mean, if you, you want to read Patricia Highsmith with a new sort of insight, you might think that uh, the, the, the Mis Mr. Ripley came out of not only the mind of a very strange woman, but also from the comic book tradition. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers, Sandra and Susan. And thank you very much to our guest questioners from the audience. Um, we really appreciate that you joined us. You were brave to come on with us and um, we thank you for sharing those. And now over to Margaret and David, thank you. Uh, David and I have a few last questions that are percolating around here. Um, David, I can start with one or, or you could, however. Sure, I'll, 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 I have a question. Um, it's so it's so much more common to see collaboration in academia or in books among in, in science. And less, you know, I can look back on the shelf that's behind me that I just pulled Mad Woman off the attic off of, and I don't think I'll find a single book that's written by two people, um, except yours. H how how do you 
you, you did it 40 years ago and you did it now. How was working together in, in this type of academic project for the two of you? Well, we often say that 40 years ago or 45 years ago, when we started The Mad Woman in the Attic, that we wouldn't have dared to do it without each other. It was such an ambitious and such a kooky idea that there was a female literary tradition. I mean, what, 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 what had we drunk? What had we smoked? Um, so uh, I think it did take a, a certain kind of solidarity uh, at that time. I don't know if Sandra will agree, but that it was a great solace to know that we, we were two and that we agreed and that we could help each other out. In those days, we would very often write together in the same room with two pens and two notebooks or two laptops, uh, and that's not possible any longer. But it nonetheless, it's very, it's very useful. It's very comforting. And the other thing that I would say is that um, I've thought a lot about that collaboration and what collaboration means. And I've thought about other collaborations, like, for example, Auden's collaboration with Chester Coleman. So that is two men in the, in the humanities. Um, and, and Auden himself made the point that what emerges out of such a partnership is a, a unique collaborative voice. I think that was particularly true with the mad woman that we we would say things like, well, nobody, this is the way we say it. Mm -hmm. And and the we was this collab collaborative we who would say or argue something in a certain way. When we did our own separate work, we I'm, I'm sure we were both influenced by what, by what we had done together, but but this collaborative voice that comes out of working together is is hard one and it's also a, a kind of uh, a, a, a protective shell in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it, to be more pro prosaic about it, it, usually we'll divide authors, for example. But then after we've done, drafted on different authors, we work very closely together. Now it's usually on, on the phone because we, we live so far apart and we can't travel. Um, and we go over every single sentence together, every single sentence. The idea is that you should not be able to tell that there's a voice change from section to section or author to author. And that we fully own all of the book. Right. Both of us. Right. That's bad. And that leads to some quarreling. That does lead to some quarreling. Absolutely. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true. Uh, and one topic that I think you both agree on, um, but and I have a question on that is, um, you know, you're you discussed a sort of overarching evolution of feminism from 1950 to 2020, uh, and I, I'm interested as to why you see that still as a second wave. Um, could it would would others say it's a third and a fourth wave? What makes this one long second wave feminism? Others would say there is a, 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 a third wave and others still would say there's a fourth wave. Um, we think about the long first wave from Seneca Falls um, all the way to the granting of the vote. And we think it's got a certain kind of coherence as a first wave. And the second wave, it seems to us, partly because of something we, we touched on before, has also got a coherence in part because the kinds of problems that um, Lorraine Hansberry and Sylvia Plath and Adrian Rich and the 50s writers were facing, that is, for example, the contradiction between domesticity and ambition, between childbearing and childrearing and poetic um, desire, that these have not been solved. Uh, part of the second wave was very, very convinced that women had to have control over their own bodies. That issue has clearly not been solved and healthcare is still an enormous problem for many, many women in America today. So the issues still are obdurate, There's, they're ongoing. I mean, in a certain, in a certain profound sense, uh, in terms of what women confront when they, when they uh, attempt to act on their ambitions, very little has changed. I can remember students coming into my office and saying, you know, we've come a long way, professor. And I would have to say, well, come back in 20 years when you have a child and are trying to struggle to find child care and, and to put things together with your, your career ambitions and your it's job at the law firm, come back and tell me that again, you know, because- It's still terribly difficult. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we've all been there and we, we feel that, and it is still the same. You're absolutely right. Um, and the last question here, um, the women's movement has been accused of being racist. Uh, I do wonder what your thoughts are on women of color um, and their experience of feminism. Uh, were they not a, a vanguard in many ways? Um, what are your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I think this was one of the most surprising things to us because we have always heard um, it's almost a platitude that the second wave was driven by white middle class women. But what we found that what we found is that the literary women who played such a prominent role in providing words and tactics to the second movement, to the women, the activists in the second in the second wave, they were the black women, women of color played an enormously innovative and early role. And they were not middle class, they were not white, they were, and they were working on their own ethnicity and their own racial issues in in tandem with their feminist issues. So- Consider Audre Lorde. I mean, consider yeah. Audre Lorde as a sort of epitome of all that. Yeah, absolutely. Comes a great theorist of, of feminism, even while she's also a poet and a lesbian and a black activist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also I would say Lorraine Hansberry, who was talking I, about the, the misery of being a housewife way before Betty Friedan, um, I would say Nina Simone, who I don't think has ever been really put in this context before, but some of her songs are revolutionary about the difficulties that black women have establishing an identity on their own from and by themselves, rather than having to inhabit categories and names foisted on them. Her, her songs, some of her songs are revolutionary. But don't forget about Toni Morrison who said she was who set out as a writer to write about the person that she thought was at the bottom of the totem pole, a little black girl in yeah. the bluest eye. I mean, and, and she really she really changed the world in a way by writing that book and then going on to write. And you see it. with her how, you know, the black power movement and the civil rights movement, they spawn, let's say a slogan like black is beautiful. And then Morrison takes it up in the novel to say, what does that mean to a black little girl who's, who wants to have blue eyes because she thinks blue eyes are beautiful. So you see the ways in which the, the black power movement, the civil rights movement are worked by Toni Morrison through a feminist lens to understand a young girl's socialization into an extremely debilitating ideology. But she also retrieved a great deal of black history in the black book. I mean, Absolutely. Arson was, you know, she was retrieving Black history even while she was giving voice to the voiceless. Yes, absolutely. So many people to thank for all the work that's been done to where we are right now, and particularly you two tonight. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, I want to thank you both and also our brave and brilliant audience members. Um, I learned so much and the learning continues uh, as we do for all our American Inspiration author events and uh, American Stories Inspiration Today. We are gonna ask um, these authors to share a reading or some reflection from the book. So they are gratefully going to, thankfully going to indulge us in that. So um, over to you, I think Sandra, you're first, is that right? Yes, I'm just gonna read two paragraphs from a section that begins glass ceilings and broken glass. Mantras of bygone days still ring in our ears. We've come a long way, Professor. We're shattering glass ceilings. We can have it all. We're leaning in and the culture's changing. But is the culture really changing? If it is, why are we and so many of our friends still mad? Mad is in the sense of enraged. Mad is in the sense of maddened, confused, or rebellious. Maybe if you come a long way, you encounter territorial backlash. Maybe if you shatter glass ceilings, you have to walk on broken glass. Maybe if you lean in, you topple over. Four decades have gone by since we opened our first co-authored book, The Mad Woman in the Attic, with the question, is a pen a metaphorical penis? We were attempting to examine the centuries long identification of authority with masculinity in order to excavate female literary traditions. Now we find ourselves mulling over a related question as we seek to understand the gender implications of American politics. In this presumably more liberated moment, 
when quite a few women have come forward as serious candidates for the presidency, we nevertheless find ourselves asking, must the president have a penis? After the 2016 election, second wave feminism had evidently both triumphed and failed. As the extraordinary women's march revealed, many were angry at the failure but also puzzled by how it could have happened during a time of so many achievements. We were baffled too. The why of this book? Because we are still mad, we seek to understand feminism's past and present in order to strengthen its future. The 2016 election proves that women and men must learn over and over again what our generation started to learn and teach in the 60s. Its aftermath also confirms that feminists today have begun channeling the rebellious rage of the mad woman we studied, a female figure incensed by patriarchal structures that have proven to be shockingly obdurate. Wow, thank you both very much. Uh, in the land of family study, I have been watching my colleagues at the Genealogical Society working very hard to make sure lives, women's lives and backgrounds are not lost as we make our family trees and that women uh, live in the past and live in the future. Um, it's so important. So thank you for your amazing work, shining light on women's lives and literature. Um, David, do you wanna say something something more about the book? Um, I'll, I'll just say that it's, it's, such an, it's such an honor to be able to talk with the two of you that, you know, who, who sat on my shelf for so long and I'm, I'm in love with this new book. I think it's a fantastic way to take what you wrote in the 70s and, and, and make it important uh, 40 something years later. Uh, and everyone, of course, will want to own this book. And portersquarebooks.com is where you will get it. Uh, and if you want the signed one, you'll put in that coupon code. But I'm just honored to be a part of this. And thank you both so very much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sandra and Susan. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, David. Thank you to our producers of GBH Forum Network. And thank you to our audience members, especially the brave ones who came on here with us with a question.